Okay, uh, good day everyone. Uh, today is uh, episode 4 of my uh, video series and uh, my name is Ryan and today I'm going to talk about uh, something different which is about basically financial education, my views on financial education and uh, real estate investment education. Okay, and um, let's start. Okay, so a bit about myself first. My name is Ryan Koo and uh, I am a uh, Malaysian based in Singapore for the past uh, 10 years and basically I am a property investor. Uh, almost full-time, I can call it almost full-time property investor, a full-time property investor and also a property agent and uh, I've done a lot of uh, seminars and talks uh, uh, for property relating to Malaysia in Singapore. Uh, also, uh, I've written two books on Iskandar Malaysia and you'll see me at uh, many events by um, Property Guru and uh, iProperty and ST Property in the, pre in the previous years before COVID. I think that sounds like a, such a long time ago. Uh, I used to write columns for the H Property and uh, I have quite a wide network in both uh, Malaysia and Singapore with regarding to real estate. And um, you will see me overseas also. I've done talks in Hong Kong. Um, this is on MM2H and also investment and retiring in Skanda. Um, and um, a bit of background, other background. Yeah, I've done a lot of transactions uh, in Malaysia and Singapore uh, for myself, for my partners, for my clients. Um, and Alpha Marketing, my company was formed in 2012. Basically, it's a consultancy that uh, helps the developers, uh, including the companies, on how to manage their property investments or property development in Malaysia. And I have a Facebook group called uh, Malaysian Investors in Singapore that has uh, more than 10,000 members today. Initially, it's a uh, started as a call group of Malaysians in Singapore to discuss about investments. Uh, but today, I think we have a wide range of nationalities, Malay, uh, Singaporeans, um, um, uh, Indonesians, other nationalities uh, uh, from many countries who talk about property, uh, usually about Singapore, Malaysia, and uh, sometimes about Australia and other parts of the world. So uh, I have other businesses in uh, Johor, uh, FY Design, Interior Design Company, uh, IMBNB, which is a short-term rentals uh, company. And uh, I'm also a salesperson uh, with uh, ERA Singapore and ERA Johor that was set up uh, this year, 2020. Okay, and um, these are my two books on Iskandar Malaysia, What's the Big Deal in Iskandar Malaysia and uh, Are You in Iskandar 2 in uh, 2018, two years ago. Of, as you can see from the books, I'm a big proponent of Iskandar Malaysia. I know that is somewhat of an unpopular view today. Many people consider Iskandar Malaysia to be a bad investment. Uh, but I think there are still many reasons why Iskandar Malaysia in the longer run will still be a much, much uh, profitable investment than most people uh, realize. And um, how I got started in property, so uh, back in 2007, this is the first property that I bought, which was basically a studio apartment in uh, downtown Kuala Lumpur, uh, near Bukit Bintang. And uh, I got a 12.8% rental yield on this property. And many, many people say, wow, Ryan, are you sure 12.8% rental yield, you are bullshitting me. <laughs> and uh, this is true. I mean, uh, I, I don't know how to tell you for the cost. These numbers today are, are definitely quite, uh, quite difficult. To achieve right in Singapore, you can get three percent. You are very happy, right? Uh, Malaysia nowadays you can get four percent. You know, four point five percent is the norm nowadays in in, in uh, KL in Malaysia, right? So twelve point eight percent is sounds ridiculous, but this is a true true point, and it got me hooked into property investment because uh, I realized uh, how much money you can make, and uh, it was a simpler time. Not many competitors, uh, not much discussion about property investment, and. Um, and so, my, actually, my, my portfolio initially was about, we, we bought about 10, uh, me and my friends. But actually, um, myself, under my own name, of course, we had about 10 uh, studios, studios and one bidders that I bought around downtown KL. We followed the trend of buying studio apartments at the time. And our yields were fantastic, right? And every unit was like 10% yield, nothing below 10% yield uh, those days, right? And that was how I got started in the property. And I, I developed an interest, a passion, and a lot of, of course, a lot of knowledge and skills in the end about uh, property investment, right? And uh, in Iskandar, Malaysia, when I came to Singapore in uh, 2009, I realized uh, after living in Singapore for a couple of years, I realized there was such a big gap, right, between what Johor and Singapore prices were. And although, I mean, we understand the gap, but also the gap was too wide. And basically, when Iskandar, Malaysia started to mature a little bit in 2012, uh, basically, I bought uh, Strata offices. This is my best investment in uh, Iskandar, Malaysia so far. I, just, I show you the good ones. There are, of course, many bad ones. I also made uh, some not very good property investments in Iskandar. But I, I show you that you can also make money in Iskandar, provided um, you know what you're doing. And of course, you execute execute well, right? Execution is also quite important. And this is a strata office I bought in, in Putri Harbour. And today we get a very decent rental yield, 4.8 to 6.8% uh, gross rental yield. And uh, the, the office tower is getting uh, much more occupied because uh, very important is that um, while high-rise condo residential, maybe there's an oversupply right now, 
But definitely for commercial space, uh, if you know what you're buying, uh, there is undersupply. And I think we did, we did pretty well with this right now. And uh, in Singapore, um, today, me and my wife, I think we have one property each, right? But uh, this is an apartment I bought uh, in uh, the city fringe of uh, Singapore. And today, of course, Singapore prices, uh, one thing good about Singapore, Singapore is very stable and prices move up fairly stable-wise, right? And uh, of course, you have the capital to play, right? And um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so this slide basically summarizes all the different uh, things my businesses do in, uh, in this kind of Malaysia. Maybe I talk a little bit more about FY Design and IMDNB. So FY Design is an interior design company. We help owners to furnish either for rental because uh, nowadays the market requires you to furnish to rent in, in JB, right? Or we also do second homes uh, uh, and, and uh, for weekend homes for those owners who buy the properties for own, own use, right? And uh, that was a business we created because we saw there was a gap and the demand for it. And the uh, other business uh, is an IMBNB, which basically is a short form for Iskandar Malaysia Bed and Breakfast. And uh, that was to capitalize on the trend of Airbnb and short-term rentals uh, globally. And uh, Malaysia actually is the number one uh, Airbnb growth country uh, for the past two years uh, prior to COVID, right? And uh, today we manage about 100 over keys uh, in, uh, in JB. Uh, via uh, what we call a hotel-like model where it's not really Airbnb, it's not really a hotel, it's something in between, right? Uh, but more on that on another day, okay? So uh, today's topics, right? Uh, my past three videos, you can go back to my YouTube, uh, subscribe, please help to subscribe. Click on the link below, subscribe now. And um, my past three videos, I talk about specific investments and reasons and specific, specific topics in Iskandar Malaysia. But today I want to cover something a bit more general. General but also quite important, which is about financial education and real estate investment education. Because I think today, many people want to become investors. People have money and they want to invest their money. But many people are actually not educated in how to become, uh, uh, how to do property investment or any form of financial investment properly. Right, and uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about wealth creation using real estate. What's the basic, most traditional, most fundamental model? Why people buy property in the first place? Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, what are the fairly popular trends or investment strategies in Singapore today. We'll talk about trends that will affect my opinion, uh, trends that affect property investment in the future, right? Because uh, things are changing, and uh, my opinion about timing, uh, because timing is a very important thing when it comes to investment. So first topic, um, property investment, to summarize is this one slide. <laughs> Investing in real estate is uh, definitely a lot more complicated compared to 10 years ago when, when actually it's more than 10 years for me, but uh, compared to 10 years ago is much, much more complicated. I, I can't give you a good reason why. Uh, I think many things, the world has changed uh, in the past 10, 15 years. And uh, it's not as easy as before, right? I think if you talk to any old timer in Malaysia and Singapore, I'm sure you'll get a similar answer, right? In the old days, right? Like for example, Singapore, right? Easy, because you are most of, the, of you are probably Singapore based. 20 years ago in Singapore, 30 years ago in Singapore, you can buy a property and get 90% loan, okay? 20, 30 years ago in Singapore, you can buy a property and prices, of course, were much cheaper. And there's no ABSD, no SSD, no TDS, no things like that, correct? Not? So can you imagine that you would just simply you were born 20, 30 years ago, right? You would have made so much more money if you had invested in property then. You understand what I mean? Right? Part of it is timing, right? Uh, part of it is like, you know, that's what I'm trying to say, right? It's a lot simpler those days. Easier, uh, simpler, right? Compared to today, today is a lot, a lot, a lot more difficult. Right, and uh, but still, it can be done. I'm not saying it cannot be done. It can be done, uh, and of course, it's a uh, property investment is still one of the best ways to preserve wealth and create wealth. Now, I want to talk about the difference of preserve wealth and create wealth. Uh, and uh, part of it is because today's education system, we don't cover financial education so much. Right? I give you an example. Right? When was the first time you learned how to bang in a check? Right, you go bang in the check. Right, most people just write a check and, and give it right, and you have how many people know how to fill up a check, right? And this is something you don't learn in school, right? Uh, you know, you you have to sign where to sign the dates. Don't write a post dated check. What does a post dated check mean? Uh, what to fill up at the back behind of the check, right? I mean, it's it's straightforward in a way, 
right? Uh, what happens if you make a mistake, right? No one teaches you this in school and you would have thought that something as important as this uh, should be taught in school, right? And example, like investments, what are shares, what are dividends, what's the difference between the unit trust, right? Uh, bonds, stocks, do it. Do, does anyone teach this to you? And, and the truth is for most of our education lifetime from school, that means from kindergarten all the way to uh, secondary university days, very, very little time is actually devoted, if any, right? And, and I think Singapore, maybe you're probably lucky in that, that you're exposed to this more compared to other countries. But I think even in Malaysia, right, there's very, very little exposure for students to learn about topics uh, about financial education, uh, much more uh, real estate uh, investment education. No one teaches you about this, right? Which is why today in Singapore and in Malaysia, you have all these property, property seminar, property education courses, why they exist and why they are so popular and why people pay thousands of dollars to go and listen. It's because no one taught them, right? Simply it's because no one taught them. The, the school system doesn't cover for it. It's not covered in the university system, but most of it, right? So when someone comes out and uh, offers to teach, right? People say, hey, yeah, I actually, I don't know much about this. I've never been formally educated on this, so I want to go and get some training, uh, some schooling. And this is why such courses exist, right? So, as I mentioned, the current education system um, doesn't cover for it, right? We are trained to be workers, right? The school system today trains, uh, Singapore especially, <laughs> more so than Malaysia, right? The school system trains you to be an employee, right? Much less to be a business person or to be an investor, right? So I think today, even for my own son, right? In the future, I'm thinking, right? Yes, going to school is important. Getting good grades, is important, but good grace is important in, in the sense of learning uh, basic skills, but ultimately skills that drive entrepreneurship, uh, innovation, I think a lot of this is not covered in the current school system. And you require a lot of entrepreneurship and innovation to be an investor, right? To be uh, a business person, right? So, um, so as I mentioned earlier, the reason why um, sometimes in the way you see in, in Singapore, also in Malaysia, right, people get scammed. Right, they say, oh, I got scam. Uh, some old lady invests uh, X thousand into this scam and, and you know, pyramid scheme, right? Uh, money game, right? And they lost money, right? Or old people, they invest their life savings into bonds sold by banks, okay? Those are not scams, but actually the, they basically invested in something which they are not familiar, right? And they're not aware of the downside risk, right? And they lost their money. The bank uh, did investment mistakes and so the capital is lost, right? And then they say, oh, the bank cheat me, you know. That. Actually, the bank didn't cheat you, but <laughs> but uh, you don't, you just, you're basically unaware of the downsides, right? When you when you buy all these investments. So, so the, the and the reason why this happens and why people complain and call Bekobu to the government and to authorities is because they have basically zero or very poor financial education or very poor real estate investment education. Same thing with people who bought properties, right? I have many people who bought properties in Iskandar, Malaysia company, ah, Ryan, the Iskandar property cannot make it, uh, this, this, this. And I realized actually a lot of people who buy property, right, they are not qualified to buy property. I mean, as investments, uh, to stay, of course, you can buy a house and you'll stay, right? But to buy property investments, these people have totally very, very little knowledge, right? They, I mean, some of them uh, didn't buy through me, they buy through other projects, and etc. and they come to me for help later. And I realized, wow, the, the, their level of financial knowledge their level of real estate investment knowledge is so poor that uh, got money but by right I, uh, got good investment also I don't dare to recommend to you to buy you know what I mean because you are so so blur <laughs> right? and you don't know it's, it's hard to teach you ask you to buy something when I have to teach you everything from the start right and then we, we uh, sometimes we are very conflicted right so on, on one hand we want to sell the properties on the other hand we, we, we don't we don't know whether you know what you're doing right and, and these are generally very uh, very very difficult balancing issues to achieve. And again, I repeat, this is because all these subjects are not taught in the current uh, education system, right? So, um, today, right, uh, like I know in recently in Singapore, there's been a lot of flack against uh, some property teachers, like for example, uh, Marco and friends, and uh, I think the, the, and the other group, um, uh, the, uh, the, I, I, the, the quadrant, uh, I, I quadrant group, right? And uh, a lot of people have been saying that they are scammers and what they teach is uh, very bad and all that. And to me, it's, 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 it's not a, they're not scammers, like, if you ask me. I mean, what they teach, I don't know them personally, yeah, to, to be, to, to be, I don't know both Marco, Marco and I don't know uh, I quadrant personally, but I mean, I, I, I have a gist of what they're teaching, right? I, I roughly know. And of course, what they teach to me is not groundbreaking, right? But for many people who have no idea, who have never been trained in financial education before or real estate investment education, I think it is, there is a value to go to such courses to learn, right? Uh, because ultimately, your eyes have not been opened to the aspect 
of property investment. So, and again, the reason why such courses exist and why they do so well is because uh, no one teaches them in school, right? And, uh, and yeah, I'm more, I'll talk about more that, about, about that later. Okay, so uh, some concepts I want to explain to the, to the viewer here, which I hope helps people to understand better uh, investments, right, or financial education. Number one, um, there is a big difference between uh, wealth management and wealth creation. Uh, same thing with a business versus salary income. Uh, economic cycle, you need to understand the economic cycle. Uh, you need to understand uh, fear or missing out. You need to catch yourself, monitor yourself, whether when you, before you make your investment, are you, are you in a formal state? That means, are you, are you investing because you're worried about missing out? You need to ask this for yourself very quickly. It's, it's, it's very important, right? And of course, the last thing is the time. How, how do you use your time as an investor and how do you leverage other people's time, right? So I go, I go through one by one. Wealth creation versus wealth management. Okay, now, Banks, I'll give you an example because of my time as a bank. Most banks have a department called wealth management, right? And when, when banks, right, sell you a product, that kind of product normally is what we call a wealth management product. It means you already got money, right? And they're just trying to help you manage that money, okay? And uh, normally how they do it, they will, they will have some set returns between 3 to 4%, 5%. So it's a normally a very low single digit number. And the reason why they have a low single digit number is number one, they don't want you to lose your money. Wealth management, wealth preservation, and number two is to the why have a that single digit is to basically fight inflation, to match inflation. So the the, the wealth of your money will, will follow inflation rate over time. Right now, a wealth management management strategy is very different from a wealth creation strategy. When you want to create wealth, that means you've got very low money. You want to make big money, thousand dollars become one million, right? The, the strategy for wealth creation is a lot more riskier, right? You need to take more risk. You want to multiply your money bigger, you need to take more risk, right? And there's more danger to your capital, right? Compared to wealth management, which is preservation of wealth. You already got millions. You just want to make sure your millions don't drop in value, right? And uh, go grow according to inflation. These are two different concepts. So, so you, you must understand when you put money in the bank, you can't expect bankers and stuff like that to multiply and do wealth creation for you. No bank will, will do things like 20, 30% return, 40% return. I mean, uh, if they do it, I'm sure they have a lot of caveats, right? But basically all these are banks are, are trying and, and even insurance companies, right? All these are wealth management strategy, right? Wealth creation is a totally different approach altogether. So you must understand the difference. When you do investment, are you doing this to preserve wealth? or to grow wealth, right? So normally when you are young, when you take more risk, you're trying to grow wealth because you don't have money anyway, so you're trying to grow wealth. Business, right? When you do a business, business is risky, right? Uh, there's a lot of risk in business, so that's trying to grow wealth. Wealth management, namely for older people who got money or people who are, you know, inherited money, then you try to preserve wealth. You don't want to lose that money, right? So that's number one. Okay, whenever you do something, are you doing wealth creation or wealth management? Okay, second, business income versus salary income. Now, um, not everyone is made to be a businessman, but especially in Singapore now. Singapore is a fantastic country to be an employee. If you ask me, right, I repeat, uh, Singapore is a fantastic country to be an employee, right? You have a fairly high income. Singapore dollar is very strong, right? Uh, job security is okay. I mean, fairly okay compared to many countries. I think Singapore is still a fairly okay uh, job security country. And uh, with the salary income that you have, a lot of Singaporeans can live uh, or it doesn't matter in Singapore, it's like if you live and work in Singapore, you can you can live a fairly decent lifestyle compared to people from many other countries. Okay? Uh, and and that's why that's why in a way it's, it's too comfortable to be an employee in Singapore, right? That nobody wants to be a businessman in Singapore, right? But comparatively, business 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 requires more risk, right? Uh, if you give Malaysia, for example, I think if you ask me, a lot of employees, if they can do it, should take the risk to be a business person in Malaysia because in, this, in Malaysia, there is more opportunity. Uh, markets are less controlled, right? So, and uh, the, the risk-reward ratio is better in Malaysia. So, in, in Malaysia, I, I always uh, encourage people, if you can, if you have the skill set, you have the, the character, right, to, preserve, to persevere, uh, business income is better. And business income is where the chance to become rich is there. Wealth creation opportunities are bigger. The chance to create wealth is much bigger through business income, right? Business people, if they do it well, one year, two years, three years, right? They can, they can become uh, very rich, right? Even if not billionaire rich, right? You will become millionaire rich for businesses who do it properly compared to salary income, right? Salary income is more stable, uh, safer, but you it's, it's quite difficult to be rich. So there is a, trade-off, right? And um, 
Of course, again, not everybody can be a business person, right? Uh, depends on who you are, your character, but how much you're willing to take the risk, right? And But definitely, if you want to be a rich person, you want to do wealth creation, then business income is definitely the way to do it, right? So, um, the third thing I want to talk about is uh, economic cycle right now. A lot of people don't understand this, right? Now, I think one of the mistakes I made in Iskandar, Malaysia was uh, we didn't look at timing and economic cycle properly. And the problem is that when Iskandar became very popular in 2012, 2013, we were probably at the peak. Well, I think looking back, you can see uh, we were at the peak of the cycle. So a lot of us bought property at peak prices, right? I still tell people, people tell me, that, oh, Iskandar, Malaysia is a bad investment. Actually, it depends on when you buy, right? If you And most of us bought during the peak and that's why we lost money. But if you look at people who bought Iskandar, Malaysia back in the earlier days, right? 2009, 2010, I think they are still sitting in money. They are still profitable even today, right? Even, uh, even 10 years later, they are still sitting on profits on their property investment. So a lot of things about property investment is actually about cycle about timing if you can get the timing right that's why you have stories about people who who just because their timing is correct they may not even have the right skills to do investment property just because they did the timing correctly uh, they made a lot of money this thing applies to property applies to business applies to uh, shares right uh, you can you can if you if you if you get if everybody can read the stock market timing so well we'll all be filthy rich <laughs> okay right but of course timing is a lot difficult more harder to read to catch exactly of course you can you can try to follow the broad trends right but it's timing is of course uh, something uh, very very difficult to catch uh, 100% right so the which comes to the thing about uh, why timing uh, and why economic cycle exists and normally part of it is uh, what we call a uh, fear of missing out right now like this this photo basically is a people queuing for bubble tea right because you know it's very popular everybody wants to try it nobody wants to miss out on it right so i give you again an example about iskandar malaysia now what happened in iskandar malaysia was that iskandar malaysia was, a, was a, the, the topic of the town everybody was buying you are buying your friend is buying the market woman is buying your your boss is buying <laughs> right your colleague is buying your sister is buying your brother is buying right so it became like you don't want to lose out. You also want to buy because you're scared. Everybody is buying. You also better. You also better buy, right? And that becomes a problem, right? Uh, fear of missing out. Same thing happens in share market all the time. Uh, like uh, in Malaysia recently, it's glove companies, right? Uh, glove companies are doing very well because of the COVID. So everybody's buying. So you buy glove company. I buy glove company. The 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 guy you buy you buy fish from says, hey, glove company is very good. So everybody is buying, right? And and that creates uh over hype, right? And prices go up too fast and people are not thinking straight, <coughs> right? And so the reason why I say uh, fear of missing out is important because <coughs> whenever you do an investment, you should actually very clearly understand this. Are you, uh, are you trying to buy because of, of a FOMO or a fear of missing out scenario, right? And, and subsequently, there's the opposite of this, right? And I think this problem is very prevalent especially in Singapore, because Singapore is a small country and the herd mentality in Singapore is very strong, right? So uh, in Singapore, it's always like this, right? If you are buying, everybody's buying, you also want to buy. If nobody is buying, nobody, you also don't want to buy. You know, you have that thing, buy right is a good investment. You look at the date, the numbers are good, but because nobody is buying, you also don't dare to buy. You've seen that before, right? People, it, nobody is buying, everybody's scared of it, nobody's heard of it, right? Investment. And because of that, you also don't dare to buy, right? Even though you've done your research and you're pretty sure you are very familiar with the product, but you don't dare to buy because nobody is buying. So you also, there's also a fear of missing out in that sense. You don't want to be the odd one out, right? And so, so in that sense, the reverse of FOMO is also true, right? So the next thing you need to understand, of course, the next concept, which I think is important is uh, time utilization, right? Now, <clears throat> as an investor, as a human being, we only have a limited amount of time. Everybody has 24 hours a day. Right? So how do you leverage the time, right? So as an investor, uh, or in this case, we talk about property investment specifically, right? Uh, there are people that you can use uh, to leverage their time out and their skills, right? So bankers, fund managers, property agents, insurance agents, all these are people which should leverage their time and their skill, right? To, to, to get maximum result, right? <coughs> and <coughs> you must understand, even though you use the time of other people, other people have their own, you need to consider these, these three factors of all these leverage people that you're leveraging on the third parties that you're leveraging on. Right? Number one is their motivations. For example, a property agent wants to sell property, right? They want to get commission. That is their motivation. Their income is from 
the commission to do sales. So whatever they advise you or tell you, you must consider that their motivation ultimately is to sell, right? Same thing with the insurance agent, same thing with the banker, or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, right? They have a motivation. Number one, you must be even. You need to balance that motivation uh, factor there. Number two is research. Sometimes, uh, you know, there's a there's a saying right? Fund managers right who buy who recommend buy sell shares are right. These people, right, they like to recommend, oh, the business is good, so buy. The business is bad, so sell. And then sometimes all these business owners will complain, hey, you fund manager, what do you know? You are just a fund manager. You sit there, analyze, analyze, analyze. Have you actually run my business before? <coughs> okay, so this is what I mean by research. So fund managers who write research reports, they do a lot of research, actually, by right. They do a lot of reading. They go through financial reports. They do site visits, right? They do a lot of research on the company, right? And so there is, so sometimes same thing in bankers and property agents. They have done research. Right, even property agents they sell property to you. They have done the research. The developer trained them on a certain uh, topic, right? But and they are familiar with the property in that sense, right? So they you have to see what's their level of research. But the third point is of course local understanding. Research and being a local is two different things, you know. <coughs> I can research, for example, Australia property a lot. I can go up and read and read and read. Analyze, do site visit, right? Uh, from Singapore, from Malaysia, right? And visit Melbourne many, many times, so that my research level, or the amount of homework I've done, is very high. But as long as I'm not a local person staying there, right? My level of local understanding will always be short, a bit, right? So same thing with again, whenever you leverage people, you need to understand uh, how much is their local understanding. They may have very good research, but are they locals, and do they have local understanding? Okay, that, that gives you a little bit of edge, a little bit of difference, right? To whether uh, they're, they're going to outperform, outperform or not. Okay, it's raining very heavily now. Okay, whether you outperform or not, right? So I think this is, so when you leverage people's time, bankers, fund managers, property agents, insurance agents, and strike could be interior designer, contractor, and things like that, right? Uh, third parties that help you. These three things you must understand, right? There is a difference between motivation research and their local understanding of the topic that they cover okay so um next topic why i see property investment or real estate as still as a wealth multiplier because number one um you buy a property say example a million dollars you take 80 percent loan you only put two hundred thousand down payment right so three years later it appreciates to let's say 1.2 million let's, let's say okay in this scenario and if you sell it Right, you pay off 800,000 bank loan, you make a profit of 200,000, and basically you double your capital in this three year time frame. Now, there are very few investments, type of investments that can do this. Now, this is a form of a wealth creation strategy. You create wealth. You take 200,000, you become 400,000 in three years. Of course, this, this, this is simplified. Like you have to pay some bank interest. There are some miscellaneous fees here and there. And of course, this is an assumption that the property does appreciate three years later to 1.2 million. Okay. Uh, of course, to do that, you have to pick, you have to choose property well, right? But when you buy a property, uh, property investment creates can be a wealth multiplier, right? And that's how many people become rich through property investments, right? That over time, their uh, their real estate investments appreciate, right? And uh, they double their capital. And this is this happens very often in Singapore, right? Uh, if you if you if you look at Singapore transactions a lot, you always get this kind of news: oh, this person made one million dollars, this person made one or one point something million dollars, make few hundred thousand. <coughs> A lot of people who sell their HGB today, right, normally will make a profit, $100,000, $200,000 profit at least, right, and more so sometimes in the private property cases, right, and so this is, it happens, it happens. Of course, again, I repeat, you have to choose the right property, right, and uh, these are all examples, right, of people who make uh, huge profits, and these are wealth creation strategies, right, because we're not talking about 2%, 3% per annum, and the reason why, uh, why this happens is, number one, uh, the money is leveraged. You take a bank loan. You use two hundred thousand to buy one million dollar things. Example, okay. This is very important. You just leverage financial leverage, right? So you use small money to buy big money. That is called leverage, right? Like it, it's called financial leverage. Leverage time. That means you use other people's time, right? So in this case, you use other people's money, right? You use two hundred thousand to buy one million dollars thing. So when when there's inflation, which is number two, and inflation is something that has happened throughout time. I mean, if you look back uh, 50, 100 years ago, right, people like to say, you know, one bowl of noodles is 50 cents, today is $5, you know, these are all grandmother's story. I'm sure you've heard before, right? Uh, you can buy a pair of shoes for a dollar, right? Uh, 
10, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, now a pair of shoes is $100, example, right? <clears throat> and you go even further back, inflation is even worse, right? In the old days, people trade with uh, uh, things like uh, stones and jewels and beads and things like that. And the reason is because uh, there was no money then, right? So if you compare stones and beads and all that compared to money today, you can see that value has moved a lot, right? Those days, you used, you had to buy, use gold to buy things. And now, uh, paper also can, right? And in moving, we move forward, be cashless, everything is just a, it's just a digital digit. So uh, inflation happens, right? And that's because uh, the, uh, the number of people on this earth is increasing, right? And, uh, it's a very big topic by itself, okay? So number three, leverage number three is uh, tenant paying rental. Now, a property investment, you can get a tenant, right? And a tenant will help you to cover uh, miscellaneous costs like uh, bank interest, right? And things like uh, property assessment, taxes, things like that. And in the old days, I mean, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, when, <laughs> right? It can even be positive cash flow, right? Now, this positive cash flow property is a bit, a bit difficult to get. Uh. For, for many, many markets, it's a bit difficult to get, right? It's, it's not the norm. Uh, of course, people who outperform, who do, who, who outperform pick the properties very well, they may still get positive cash flow, right? But uh, basically, uh, uh, but it's still, whatever it is, uh, get, getting a tenant is still a powerful leverage, right? It helps you provide, ultimately, it's holding uh, power, right? Because you need to wait the three years, right? Just now you buy a million, uh, buy the property a million, you want it to appreciate 1.2 million, you need to wait three years. Let's say right. So for the three years, you need to have holding power, right? And a tenant provides that holding power to you, and that's something property uh, can give, right? So in this slide is what uh, I used to borrow from somewhere I saw online. It was called the Millionaire Employee's Way to Real Estate Millions, right? So you don't have to be a business person to create wealth, right? So business is one way to create wealth, but the other way to create wealth, if you remain an employee through investments. One way to do it is via real estate, right? Where your stable income protects your uh, protects your downside, protects your your your, your bank installments, right? It gives you the holding power, while the property appreciate over time through inflation, right? So if you can see in this in this in this table, you assume that you pay uh, you buy a four hundred thousand property uh, every five years. That's basically the model, right? Of course, in different cities, Singapore or Malaysia or other countries, this number will change. But the general idea is the same. Like this, this chart was actually de designed by for someone for the US, right? And uh, and it still holds true in the US, right? You buy a property for four hundred thousand. Every five years, you buy an average property in an average location, right? Uh, and over time, as inflation takes in, right, you will make your million uh, dollars, even if it's negative cash flow. Uh, right, because you are uh, employee, you have holding power, and your and your income also grows over time. Right, you can have uh, you can have this uh, chart here by the time you retire at uh, fifty five years old. So the question is, uh, can this be done in uh, in Singapore or even Malaysia? In Malaysia, you can. Uh, actually, I think in Malaysia definitely you can you can do this. Right, but can this be done in Singapore? Right. So um, we'll come to that later, but. Coming to property cycle, right? So um, different countries have different cycles, right? So uh, like Singapore, the length of the cycle in Singapore is different compared to the length of the cycle in Malaysia, right? Uh, compared to Australia. It may be different by cities, right? Uh, uh, every country could be different. Every city could be different. The length of the cycle could be different, right? Uh, it could be as short as six months. It could be as long as one year or 10 years, right? Uh, each, each section of the cycle. So... Um, <coughs> Uh, you have to ask yourself for property in Singapore today or in Malaysia or whichever market that you're interested in, where are you in the cycle today? Okay, so uh, this is an example of a Singapore cycle up to uh, I think uh, sometime 2019, right? You can see even in Singapore, the length of each cycle is different, <coughs> right? And uh, even in the last cycle of Singapore, uh, not everywhere uh, make money. Some places uh, make more money, some places lost money, right? Uh, some people are some places are more flat, right? Uh, this is this chart from Property Guru, right? This is to reflect the effect of a cycle, uh, in in Singapore, right? And human nature controls drives property cycles, like I mentioned earlier. Fear of missing out is the is the is is, is the, the thing that drives supply demand imbalance, right? So property markets are not. I always say like say this: property markets are not good or bad; they're just cyclical, right? So people say, "Oh, London very bad." Uh, these few years, I say it's not London is bad. London is just at the wrong side of the cycle, right? Or Malaysia is bad. Uh. actually, again, it's not Malaysia is bad. You just bought at the wrong part of the cycle, right? <coughs> so 
why does property cycles happen, right? There's always a supply and demand thing. So initially when supply is low, demand is high, market look attractive, okay? <coughs> supply low, demand high, ma. or you can say because supply is low, so demand is high, right? Uh, so market look very attractive. And then because of that, uh, developers, property developers, investors will enter. They will say, hey, this market condition now very good. Uh, so they enter the market, right? And because of that, once too many investors and developers enter, supply will increase to the point, right? Developer build a house, investor buy the house, <coughs> supply will increase to the point where it tips, right? Where supply now becomes higher than demand, right? And then the market becomes unattractive and the market will start to fall, right? And then developers will stop coming in, investors will stop coming in, and then supply, and because of developers and, uh, and investors stop buying, right? Supply will start to drop also, right? And then this gives time for demand to catch up, right? And until supply is uh, insufficient again, and then the cycle will basically uh, repeat, right? Now, to give you an example, in property investment, right? So <coughs> red is demand, green is supply. So let's say in this particular market, green, this is the supply of houses. And because of economic growth, because all countries are growing, it's just whether you grow fast or so. Singapore grow 1%, 2% a year, Malaysia grow 4 5% a year, Thailand also grow 4 5% a year, China grows 6 7% a year, but all countries are generally growing economically. right? So you can see, let's say this area, uh, supply is fixed, uh, demand is increasing, so now you have a situation of uh, uh, demand higher than supply. And because of that, <coughs> because of that, uh, developers build new houses. So you see supply start to increase and investors buy the house. So basically the houses, the house supply increase, right? And then it reaches a point where the building of houses is faster than the building, than the demand growth. And why does this happen is because normally at one point in time, right, whenever, when all the developers and the investors are referring to the, to the market, right, they're referring to the market at this point in time and they never check for all the other people around them, right? And this happens in many countries in the world where uh, property development and market control is not done well. Now, Singapore is one country that this doesn't happen because URA actually has a, done a very good job. And I think that's because Singapore is also small, right? It's easier to monitor. So Singapore is a small city state, right? And uh, uh, I think they have done a very good job in trying to manage demand versus supply expectations. So government controlled the amount of land that is released into the market, right? But in many other countries, whether Malaysia, Australia, or the US even, right, you will notice that many of the governments, the local authorities do not monitor this number very well. And you cannot expect the developers to monitor the number very well so because they also depend on data from the government, right? So the government don't provide data or don't check and developers also cannot check. So there's always a scenario where developers, too many developers enter at the same time because they're all referring to last year's number and they all build at the same time. And, and because houses take a, a time to build, three years, four years, two years, whatever. So by the time the supply all come in one shot, right? It's very, very easy for the supply demand balance to tip, tip into oversupply, right? And so this creates oversupply, right? As you see on the slide now. So, and when, when this happens, the feeling is uh, despair. People feel despair. And I think Iskandar is in, in, in a way in that cycle right now. Uh, many people are feeling very, very desperate in, in, in Johor today. So uh, when despair happens, prices will start to fall. People try to uh, panic sell, right? And, and there are no more new developers building, right? Uh, no new construction, right? Everyone's just trying to fill up the existing supply, right? And over time, as you see here, no new construction happens. So the line, the green line remains straight for a very long time until uh, one day when economic growth catches up, right? Then the cycle will basically uh, repeat itself okay so um so time is important so uh here i want to talk a little bit about um becoming a full-time property investor and the truth about property gurus okay uh, i created this slide because i saw there was a lot of uh, attacks uh, right on people like marco and friends and i quadrant and actually in malaysia there's also similarly a lot of flag going on on the, those similar people like uh, right? property gurus and teachers in, in in malaysia right and um i think the question is um, financial education, right? And, and as I say in my slide here, I play football very well. I think I play very well, right? But I will not be a Premier League player, right? And and the thing is, sometimes you use your you use your knowledge at your level to con and you save those people that are trying to scam you or teach you or you know and, and, and all that. But I think that the issue is that because um, uh, 
there is a lack of financial education. And the reason why property education courses exist is because they want to teach people this gap, right? And, I, and as I mentioned earlier, right, of course, many of these property teachers, property education seminars, they make a lot of money from their courses. That is the truth, right? And it is a source of income for them. That is their motivation, right? But they have done their research and they have some local understanding of the market and the segment that they're doing in. So uh, in that sense, you are paying to learn, right? If you find yourself why you're so stupid, go and pay them to learn because you yourself don't know. Man. If you yourself know the market very well, you will not be paying them uh, to learn, right? And uh, and so, and so the cycle is and so that's so that it, it, so that's why they exist, right? So it, it, you want to say the scam? It's not really a scam. They're trying to teach you something. Is the knowledge they teach you cannot be learned elsewhere? No, you can learn it elsewhere. You can learn it yourself even. But like everything, right? A lot of people don't go and learn themselves, right? They never go through the research. They never go through the local understanding. So you pay someone to learn. This, uh, this information, right? And another thing I want to talk about is these teachers, right? These financial education teachers, they come and go, right? I've seen so many over the past 15, 16 years of my investment career, right? Malaysia, Singapore, even, you know, in, in the old days in Singapore, you have people like Wendy Quack and Jerome and all this and Patrick Liu. Patrick Liu is still here, right? And, and today, they are less active, really. You don't really see them so much nowadays, but you have new people like iQuadrant and Marco, right, for example. These are the new generation of property education uh, teachers, and what they teach actually is uh, somewhat different, right? Uh, some of the things they teach today are, are not covered in, in the old days because the, the market has changed, right? Uh, and, and you can't, some strategies that worked last time don't work today. So new strategies uh, need to be found, right? Uh, same thing with property agents, right? They are very famous agents from 10, 10 years ago who you don't see today, <laughs> right? And, and, and uh, it happens, right? So, uh, yeah. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, you need to understand the, when you leverage the parties, uh, motivation, research, and their local understanding, right? You are paying for that, uh, basically, right? So, uh, it's not a scam per se, right? So, yeah, that's my, my two cents. Okay, so what's popular in Singapore today, right? I cover some of these things, right? Because maybe you feel that uh, you don't want to pay thousands of dollars to learn from these people. So <laughs> I, I give you my, my, my very short answer about this. Number one, uh, strategy number one, buy a new property from developer. Uh, you can make money like that. Yeah, yes, you can. Uh, number two, you buy a resale property from the market because resale has uh, more value. Yeah, you can also make money like that. Number three, you buy commercial property. Uh, if you got a lot of money, you can do this. <laughs> number four, you buy REITs uh, because uh, good, uh, yield, yes. Number five, you can buy or lease an industrial property, right? Uh, I'll talk about that later. Number five is co-leading, which I'll talk about that later. And number six, the last one, which, which is probably a bit, uh, maybe not, is uh, my personal push is uh, uh, buy something overseas. Now, number one, buy a property from a, or buy a new launch from developer or buy a resale. Now, why buy a new launch? Normally, a developer has a team. Right, uh, and, and the team can be things like Greater Southern Waterfront, Bayer Labour, Airbase Record uh, Relocation, Jurong Lake District, uh, Woodlands, Woodlands uh, as a hub, or they say M Block on the area, or there's no supply, a new MRT. These are there's always a team, right? Most projects have a team, right? And number two is uh, actually Singapore still has a fairly high incoming supply, but as I mentioned earlier, URA has done Singapore URA has done a very good job to balance uh, land release and demand. So they have managed to keep prices very stable. And I think they're very good. Thumbs up to Singapore, you are, you are very good. I think you can't find a, a, a people like this anywhere else in the world, <laughs> right? And uh, even with COVID, right, uh, they released the number of, they reduced the number of land sites available for sale, but still uh, with a stable demand from Singapore, because Singapore's a small country uh, and uh, people need housing and uh, people want upgrade housing, right? So there's, there's this upgrade from HDB to uh, private condo and, uh, so housing demand is fairly stable. So you see, although supply is high and but tapering, right? But you still see it's, it's fairly stable prices. But you can still make money. Uh, buy right, you can still make hundred thousand, two hundred thousand uh, after DOP after completion, right? Uh, in a new launch, right? Um, and, but new launch is also fairly high uh, comparatively because of unblock last time. Uh, and then uh, immigration is coming. Uh, Singapore immigration. I, I mean, I know some people say that oh, because of uh, elections and political pressure, Singapore government will not grow the 6.9 million. I, that's bullshit. I think it will grow the 6.9 million population. It's just a question of when and how the government plans to open the trigger. Uh, and they will not tell you 6.9 million because now it becomes very sensitive pretty. But then uh, this will happen because otherwise Singapore cannot grow, right? Uh, and and uh, th there is a need and this can only be achieved through immigration because birth rate in Singapore is very low and you cannot expect birth rate to change uh, in, in a short period of time. And last thing is, uh, but the problem with, of course, uh, buying a new launch or resale in Singapore 
it's high capital outlay in ABSD, right? You can only buy one, right? After that, you cannot ABSD, and then it's very difficult to buy second or third private property in Singapore today compared to, say, 10, 20 years ago when you can buy many, many, many. Now you have this problem. So, a typical strategy that most agents uh, try to push you, or most uh, property property teachers in Singapore have issues, is to sell HDB, upgrade to buy two private property. Normally, it's one condo, or the second one may be industrial for cash flow. Okay, so this is a very common uh, theme. Uh, in, in a common strategy in Singapore today. Uh, and um, yeah, okay, I cover this. Okay, number two, buy commercial property. Uh, commercial property like shop house and strata retail, all that. Um, limited supply, Singapore has limited supply. So uh, the problem because of that, uh, and, and, and today if you do this, I think it's, it's too late for the average investor because prices are very high, require very high capital, right? And then the uh, yields are very low now, it's like 2%, 1% yield, right? And uh, if you buy strata retail, normally the problem is that you don't have control over the building. I think a very famous example, Boogie's Cube, right? Boogie's Cube was bought over by a very big uh, investment uh, group and then it's a strata retail, right? On paper, it's very good, good location. Boogie's just opposite Boogie's. MRT, Bugis Junction, and they, wow, very good property, but the project suffered for a very, very long time because uh, management was split. And actually in Singapore, there are many examples of uh, worst case examples than uh, Bugis Cube, right? This, uh, uh, this is in Novena Regency, and there, uh, there are many cases, I, I don't want to name all of it in Singapore, where uh, strata retail didn't do so well, uh, that they are in poorer locations, and there's no management, okay? Or management doesn't do much, right? So this is also an issue. Uh, when you buy strata retail, so, so that's a risk when you buy commercial property in Singapore, right? Number three, you can buy REITs. Now, REITs, the good thing is, of course, capital you can buy with very small capital, and uh, prices are normally very stable uh, for REITs, and uh, the yield is normally very decent, right? Uh, three, four percent, whatever. But the problem is, there's no leverage, right? And if you if you see my earlier slides, one reason why you do property investments is because you want leverage. No leverage, then no point, right? This is so to me, REITs are uh, it's not wealth creation. REITs is wealth management, <laughs> right? Uh, it's a wealth management product, right? You get three, four percent yield. That's not going to make you rich, right? You cannot leverage, so it's it's only a, it's a it's a it's a wealth management product. Number four, uh, this is the one that has been very famous these few years, which is to use industrial property to create cash flow. Now, uh, you can buy very uh, low price industrial property that can be converted to office space. Uh, and you get very positive cash flow, and the, and the property is cheap because normally there's a very low uh, lease. Uh, left and that allows you the chance to create positive cash flow, right? So a bit of renovation, a bit of uh, uh, makeover, you can create, you can increase the yield, right? And if you do this over multiple properties, which is what most, most financial education companies are trying to teach you, uh, financial property education companies in Singapore try to teach you that I call them Marco. Basically, this is the, the, num the number one uh, technique, right? Buy the property to create cash flow. Right, and uh, not enough money you share with a few people, but anyhow, I think all this initial property, property is actually very cheap one. So actually, you, you, you may not need that much money, much money in the first place, right? <coughs> but the problem with this kind of low lease property is that they are unlikely to have uh, capital appreciation. But with the cash flow, you may you will probably recover all your money anyway uh, quite fast in, in the first place, just that you, you, you don't make capital appreciation. And I think that's also a problem because ultimately, uh, you want to sell, and that is where wealth creation happens, right? Rental yield is good, but well, rental yield, unless you've got big amount of rental yield, does not make you, uh, does not make you uh, rich. It's not a wealth creation strategy, right? Uh, next one, of course, co-living schemes. Now, co-living is basically, to me, uh, it's just room rental. You rent a property, you renovate, you make over, make it nice, then you rent out by rooms, and that will increase your yield. Because you rent out by room, you always get a higher yield than you rent out the entire property, right? Each room rental is more, you get more rental overall if you rent by room, instead of you rent by entire property. So, uh, and normally this is very smart. They do after uh, CBD areas near MRT, uh, and they cater for some of the those foreigners who are working in the CBD, who don't want to go too far, into the suburb areas, right? So uh, they want to stay near the office, stay near the, the happening areas in, in Singapore town center, so, uh, city center. So they, these are the type of properties that you do. Uh, lease and sublet. And the good thing is you don't have to buy. You can rent and re-rent again, right? So uh, sublet, uh, basically in Malaysia, it's called sublet, right? And uh, yeah, this, this also works, uh, create cash flow, right? And if you, you can do it over multiple properties also, right? You can, you can rent three condos, refurbish, and then rent out by rooms, you can make money, positive cash flow, right? So, and of course, again, no capital appreciation because there's no ownership. You don't own the property. So if the property appreciation price also, you cannot make money out of it, 
right? So also a problem. And number six to me is of course buy overseas property. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm a pro Iskandar Malaysia person, so definitely you will see me put this slide in. Uh, the problem with buying overseas is of course you're not familiar lah. You are you're from Singapore, you're from Malaysia. If I ask you to buy London, sure you don't know lah, right? Huh? Unless you're very familiar with London, which is quite rare. Not many people are that familiar. Right, and uh, you, you sometimes people don't understand the difference between developing country and developed country. Right, developing country and developed country, the way the market grow is different. <laughs> There's currency risk, right? Like ringgit versus Singapore dollar is a currency risk. Uh, the project that you get in Singapore may not be the best deal from this country. This is called marketing agent risk. The agent that bring a project to Singapore may not bring you the best project. How you know this is the best project, right? You only he only bring you one project. This could be the not the best project, right? Uh, there could be other projects in that country which are better, right? So sometimes I say the same thing, right? So I say, I say, oh Malaysia bad, Malaysia bad. It's not Malaysia is bad. It's that the project that they sell to you in Singapore no good, <laughs> right? If the good project already sold out in Malaysia already, right? You need to go to Malaysia to buy, for example, or you need to know you need to buy before the project comes to Singapore, for example. Sometimes it's like this, right? So this is what I call uh, marketing agent risk, right? Uh, the agent sell you a property which is not the best. The market is not the best. The market could be better, sorry, but the property that they bring you is, is new, is, to you is not the best investment grade property. And the last one I think is which the point that a lot of people fail to realize is inability to manage due to distance. If you live in Singapore, you buy property in London, how do you manage? If you buy property in Philippines, how do you manage? If you buy property in Malaysia, how do you manage? This is something to consider. Okay. So, but the benefits of investing overseas, now number one, diversification. Okay. Uh, you don't fully depend on Singapore. Number two is you can take bank loan outside Singapore. As I mentioned, one way to become rich is to leverage bank money, other people's money, right? So you need to, and in Singapore, you can, there's only a limited amount of money you can borrow from Singapore banks, right? As an individual. But if you can take loan from banks outside Singapore and other countries, even better. That's good. Very, very good. One, one important thing to become rich. Number three is uh, you want to have a lower investment quantum, don't come out so much money. Right, which we can do over different type, different type properties, uh, higher potential capital appreciation because let's say developing market the 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 chance to appreciate is higher because the market starts from a lower base, and of course there are some fringe benefits. I think like second home education. This is why people buy property in uh, in, in UK or in, in Australia, right? Because there are some benefits like that. Some why well, this is why people buy property in JB, in in Jakarta because they think of retirement, right? So these are also other uh, potential benefits, right, for buying overseas. So, uh. Yeah, but I'm not going to cover in detail of that later today. But <laughs> so another thing I'll talk about, which I think is my, my second last important topic for this for this video is that uh, macro trends right now, um, a lot of things have changed. Uh, the world has changed and property investment has to change along with it, right? I think the first thing that we need to take note in Singapore is uh, aging, right? So Singapore is a is an aging country, right? Uh, we compare to like Vietnam and Malaysia are very young countries. Okay, uh, the average population is below uh, let's say 30, 30 years old. So anyone in Vietnam below 30 years old is young. Anyone below uh, in Singapore is 40. So if you are above 40 years old in Singapore, you're considered old. Yes, you're the older half. Already. Below 40, you're the younger half. Above 40, you're the older half. This, this is what it means by median. Right? And Japan is at 46. So you can see that Singapore is aging. And aging will create certain issues for Singapore. Number one, the workforce will shrink. Not enough people to pay CPF to support all the old people. That's going to be a problem for the Singapore government. Right, uh, it's going to be a problem for other countries also, but uh, I mean, Singapore is aging fa faster than a lot of countries, so Singapore has this problem also, and it will affect property investments, right? And in the sense that old people have different requirements for houses, what are the requirements that old people have, okay, for housing? So this will affect, right? And if you ask me, uh, old people will have two things they want to prepare for retirement, right, have enough money for retirement, and have a place to stay for retirement. Right, these are two things to consider suitable for them, right? And they may also think about uh, how do I <coughs> settle the issues for my children for them to stay. So I need to have enough wealth for all three purposes, right? Uh, older people have these issues, right? In, in Japan, right, because of aging, uh, this is an important story to share. And because of aging, so many old people in Japan that you have abandoned houses in Japan now. Tokyo, property in Tokyo, Osaka is expensive because these are cities, right? But if you go to Kampong area in Japan, uh, rural in Japan, you can get houses for free. You have towns uh, in Japan uh, where the town mayor will offer you the house for free as long as you come to stay. You come and stay in their village, they will give you the house for free. The house are damn cheap. Okay, I used to met this Singapore woman. She used to work in Japan. She told me that she might want to retire in Japan. I said, huh? Why retire in Japan? Isn't Japan expensive? She said, no, if you stay in the countryside, the houses are very, 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 very cheap. 
So I was very, su- I was very surprised to hear that. And I did a bit of research. And yeah, she's true, right? There are a lot of places in rural Japan where houses are damn cheap, right? And if you watch a lot of Japanese uh, tourism shows, uh, you go to Kampong area one, right? Really, uh, there's no one in the Kampong area one. There are rural area really got nobody there. <laughs> right? Very, very low amount of people, right? So Singapore will have about 900,000 uh, age 65 and above by the year 2030, another 10 years from now. That's a big number. Yeah. If you mentioned Singapore has uh, 3 million plus population, uh, right? Citizens, uh, citizens, 3 million plus citizens, sorry. Right? Almost one third uh, is age 65 and above. That's, uh, that's really a terrifying number if you think about it. Okay, so uh, so for Singapore to grow further, to enlarge the working base so that enough people pay CPF for government policies to run and, uh, and etc. Right, it has, immigration has to happen. I mean, I, I may you may be a bit angry at me for saying this. Like right? I'm Malaysian, maybe oh you're you're Malaysian, you don't understand, right? But I tell you, I don't see how else the Singapore government is going to solve this problem. And actually, a lot of governments are solving the problem this way. This this is why uh, Japan is now allowing more foreigners to work in Japan. Same thing with Hong Kong and US for so many years. Why the US can grow so well for so many years until recently is because they are very, very poor immigration. They allow many immigrants to move into US. Right? Without that, US will have a very difficult chance to grow economically. Right? So same thing, uh, Singapore will have to do this. It's just a matter of time and how, and they will not use the 6.9 million figure anymore, but uh, they will have to do it somehow in the future. Right? Uh, and in Malaysia, right? of course, uh, sorry, in Singapore, of course, many of the migrants in, in Singapore are from, from Malaysia, like myself, right? And uh, a lot of them also convert to Singapore already, right? But, uh, and this is the reason why I'm also pro Iskanda, because eventually uh, there'll be some flow back into Malaysia also, and JB is the first point of entry, right? And next, and then, um, next thing, of course, I'll talk about is uh, population growth rate. Now, population grow very fast in the past uh, 50, 60 years. Right? If you look at the global population, right? Uh, human population in the, on, on this planet, right, grow very fast exponentially in, from, let's say, 1900s onwards, in the past 100 plus years, right? So, but it'll start to slow down again, right? Uh, you can see that the, actually it's slowing down already, right? Because as people have less children, right, our parents' generation, they got many kids, right? <coughs> our grandpa- grandparents' uh, generation, they got many kids. Now we have one kid, two kid, three kid, four kid already, a lot already. Three kids also consider a lot, right? So the growth rate will slow. Now, how will this affect property? Uh, it may affect property in the sense that housing rate will also not grow so fast. Yes. Okay. Because population not growing so fast now, so why need to build so many houses? Right? So, uh, property construction rate will also slow. Right? And the next thing, sorry, I can see baby boomer generation. These are people who were born after the war, World War II, and Gen X onwards, it means from my generation onwards, the growth rate has started to uh, slow. But, and then, this was something that uh, Jack Ma and Elon Musk uh, discussed sometime end of last year. Uh, one of the biggest problems the world will face, or actually they said the biggest problem is that world population collapse because the number of babies being born uh, is dropping. Okay, But even though that's happening, we have another thing called rural urban migration. That means everybody moved from the kampong, from rural area, moved to the city. So even though population growth rate is slowing, but cities will still see population growth above average, in fact, because everybody wants to stay in the city, nobody wants to stay in the rural area, right? And major cities will see the bulk of population also grow. So the bigger the city, the faster they grow, which is why like China has so many mega cities, Europe has mega cities, which are population 8, 10 million, 20 million population cities, right? Singapore, 5 million is actually considered a little bit small already, okay, as a city. Right, so Singapore also need to become a mega city if they want to attract more talent, more people. Otherwise, got problem, right? People don't want to stay, right? So, uh, urbanization, right? Uh, people moving from rural area to urban area. So, even though population growth is slowing, but cities, major cities, will get it better, which is what <coughs> I give you an example of London, right? Everyone talk about London, but do you think everybody who works in London actually live in London? <laughs> do you think that everybody who works in London live in London? No, and, 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 and today London has many train, MRT, highway that link them to areas outside of London because London is very expensive, cannot afford to stay. So example, this case is a town called Milton Keynes, right? Now Milton Keynes came on an article to say, that, oh, this is one of the better places to live today in the greater London area. And it's actually damn far, no? 65 km uh, to go to London CBD, but you can take train. The train is only 30 minutes. So even though 65 km away, take train, train to six, uh, uh, 65 k, uh, 30 minutes, not so bad. I can live in Milton Keynes, go to work in London. Okay, so this is what a mega city uh, 
looks like. And uh, similarly, we can, I know I've talked about mega cities in many of my presentations before, right? Uh, you can, uh, uh, Guangzhou, Hong Kong, Shenzhen is one example of a mega city here in the future. Greater Shanghai, Greater Shanghai all the way to Hangzhou. Tokyo definitely is a mega city. Take, if you actually Tokyo, uh, you go all the way to the outskirts, it's actually damn far. Okay? It's like almost 100, 150 km kilometers, one, okay? but it's damn big. Washington, New York, Greater London, New York, Greater, Greater Sao Paulo, Mexico City. There are many examples across the world. Right. Can Singapore become a mega city? Now, Singapore mega city uh, requirement is to you need to merge with uh, with uh, JB. No JB cannot become a mega city. Very difficult, and that's why I believe that the Iskandar Singapore integration will happen. Right. Uh, don't have to worry about politics. Right. I mean, politics is, is a it's a problem, but I mean, this is a problem that can be resolved. Right. Once uh, economic considerations will always outweigh political uh, considerations. Uh, and, and we see it happening with the RTS, right? So, a picture right now. If there was a landed property with a rental of 4,000 freehold, this is the price, and you get a yield of 8.7% near international schools, would you buy this property? Okay. And would you buy this property if there was an apartment, two bedroom apartment, a rental 3,500, and a sale price 400,000, right? And uh, you get a 9% over yield, would you buy this property, right? Uh, give you give you a thing, and the truth is, sorry, uh, let me send a quick text. Okay, the truth is, um. These are, if you look at it in the numbers from this way, both these properties are very good investment grade properties, right? Good pricing, uh, good yield, right? Uh, and it's a, yeah, I would buy. And I can tell you, actually, these two properties were both listed back in 2009 uh, in Iskandar, Malaysia. Okay, 2009, 2010, right? And, and at that time, right, Iskandar was offering this type of uh, numbers, 8.7%, 7% rental yield, and... Uh, 9.3% rental yield, uh, freehold properties, right? And that's the reason why a lot of people uh, bought in Skandar Malaysia because at the time the numbers look good, but because of <coughs> oversupply, people keep we, we keep building too many properties, right? And that's why the yield drop, prices went up, too many people buy, so prices keep going up, rental yield keep dropping, right? And then that's why the market is what it is uh, today. So this is to give you an example about the effects of timing on, on property prices, right? And the last thing is, of course, income inequality, right? Uh, we have an issue today where uh, the rich are very rich, the poor is very poor, <laughs> and the middle income, middle class, find that it's very difficult to maintain their middle class uh, status, right? And uh, this happens across Singapore, across Malaysia, right? Everyone in the middle class feels that property is too expensive, right? And it's not something that can be solved easily, right? <clears throat> um, and normally, uh, yeah, normally it's measured as uh, annual income over housing price. Um, and uh, this is a problem that's also happening. I, I can't give you an answer for this, right? It, 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 I, I believe what happens is that a lot of properties will become uh, segmented. There's a type of properties meant for the rich, a type of properties meant for the poor, right? And uh, Singapore already has some version of it, which have HDB and private properties, right? I, I'm not saying HDB is for poor people, right? But Singapore already tried to solve this problem by having two two type of markets, right? Uh, it, maybe a lot of markets in other countries will have to do this also to help control prices. Okay. Okay. So uh, in Korea also happens, right? It usually happens in developed countries a lot, right? Uh, where the lower middle class find it a problem to get to get uh, to get the property ladder. Okay. Singapore also because uh, prices increase, store population growth, so yield has dropped. And uh, this some slides about showing about how property in the, and that Iskandar is not, you know, people like to say Iskandar is a bad investment, but actually it's not just Iskandar problem. You know, uh, Australia property has, has also not done very well in the past few years. Uh, Aussie dollar also dropped a lot, right? And uh, same thing with uh, uh, British property, UK property, right? Pound also dropped a lot. So these prices have uh, dropped a lot in the past uh, 10 years. So you say ringgit dropped a lot, but actually Australia, UK, uh, Malaysia also have not done very well property wise uh, because of the cycle also right so uh, <clears throat> there was a big boom of property back in 2011 2013 and I think uh, 
the time the famous countries to buy, of course, are Malaysia, Australia, UK. And I think for even Malaysia, Australia, UK, nowadays, the, most of the cities in these countries are still in a downturn and the recovery is still uh, taking a bit of a time, right? Singapore actually has recovered, but they, this, these other cities have not, right? So uh, to summarize, uh, number one, uh, understand financial education. Uh, if you don't have it, it's okay to pay people to learn, but you need to understand their motivations and their research levels and their local understanding. Uh, you need to understand what type of property investment vehicles suit you and uh, what is the best of different different strategies that we have in Singapore today. And you need to understand concepts, as I mentioned earlier, timing. Timing is very, very important, often underappreciated. Uh, understand fear of missing out. Do you buy something because you fear of missing out? And the time utilization, how to use people around you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. I think I think I talked too long with this video. So, <laughs> so I hope you enjoy uh, what I shared today. And uh, if you like, please uh, share, subscribe, and uh, and uh, this video. And I hope to hear from you soon. If you have anything to say, please drop a comment a bit at the below. Thank you very very much.